Let us worship God, let us sing to his praise in Psalm 143 and the second version, second version of the psalm. O hear my prayer, Lord, and unto my desire. Was that the version that, yep. Uh, to bow thy knee, record, I humbly thee and require, and in thy faithfulness unto me answer make, and then thy righteousness upon me pity take. In judgment enter not with me, thy servant poor, for why this well I wot, this well I know, no sinner can endure the sight of thee, O, Lord, o God, if thou his deeds shalt cry, he dare make none abode himself to justify. Behold the cruel foe, my me persecutes with spite, my soul to overthrow, yea, he my life doth down quite unto the ground hath smote, and made me dwell full low in darkness as forgot, or men dead long ago. Therefore my spirit much vexed, overwhelmed is me within my heart, right sore perplexed, and desolate hath been. Yet I do call to mind what ancient days record, the works of every kind I think upon, O Lord. Lo, I do stretch my hand to thee, <coughs> O Lord, O Lord, for thou well understands, O my complaint and moan. As my thirsting soul desires and longeth after thee, as thirsty ground requires with rain refreshed to be, the Lord, let my prayer prevail to answer it make speed. For lo, my soul doth fail, hide not thy face in need. Lest I be light to those that do dark to sit, <coughs> or him that downward goes into the dreadful pit. <coughs> Psalm 143, eh, from the beginning, second version. We hear my prayer, Lord, and unto my desire. Oh, hear my prayer, Lord.
us pray. O oh Lord, we read of the warnings of thy word, the truth of thy word, that there is a fearful pit. And we are warned to avoid going down into that fearful pit. And we thank thee, O Lord, that the psalmist uh, could say that thou didst take him from a fearful pit and from the miry clay. And thou didst uh, prevent him from going down into that eternal pit. And we pray, O Lord, that we would therefore likewise seek the way of escape which we have in thy word. We thank thee for the gospel, which is good news, which informs us that although there is a fearful pit, there is a way to avoid it. There is a way whereby we need not, and we will not, go into that fearful pit. Even through thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he went into that fearful pit. He descended, in one sense, metaphorically, into hell. He certainly experienced the pains of hell for him. We do not believe that he went into hell as such, but he didn't need to go into hell to experience the pains of hell, uh, because um, thou didst uh, lay upon Christ the iniquity of us all, and in being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, thou hast put him to grief. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the grief that he was acquainted with and the sorrows that he experienced was the grief that belonged by right to others. But he took it upon himself so that those who believe in him would not experience that grief and that sorrow. And we pray, Lord, that we would ever have this before us as we come before thee in worship. That is what engenders a spirit of thankfulness to thee that we have been delivered from so great a death, not only physical death, which we will all experience unless the Lord comes while we are alive, mm. and then we shall be changed. But um, the, thou hast delivered us from uh, the second death, that eternal death, the death of the Lord, which uh, is the uh, portion of all those who do not believe the gospel. But we thank thee, the Lord Jesus Christ has tasted death for every man, so that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And we pray, Lord, that this would be our knowledge, our experience, our persuasion, our conviction, uh, that if we are in Christ, then all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. And there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ because there is no, no longer any guilt. The wrath of God is no longer revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness of those who are in Christ. And rather, thy wrath has been turned away, thine anger has been turned away, not because thou wast forgotten thine anger or forgotten thy wrath, but because that anger and that wrath fell upon one other, another, even our substitute and thy eternally begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we pray, therefore, that ever before us would be the good news of the Gospel, uh, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As we come, O oh Lord, at this time, we pray we would come confessing our own sin, for if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And uh, every, not a day passes uh, without us accumulating sin and guilt. Thy word tells us that uh, th th this is so, but thy word also assures that if we confess our sin, thou art faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we see sin as our great enemy. Sin is an enemy. Sin is that which destroys, not just Satan, but sin. And even if Satan no longer existed, sin would still exist. And that would be sufficient to destroy us and expose us to the pains of hell forever. But we thank thee, Lord, that sin has been overcome through the atonement of Christ. But we pray, therefore, Lord, that we would therefore not embrace sin. 
Sin is natural to, to the natural man. It is part of our fallen nature. And even those who have been renewed inwardly, there is still within us the flesh which was against the Spirit. And we are warned to make no provision for the flesh. For if we by the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. But if we sow to the flesh, then we shall reap to the flesh. We shall reap everlasting woe, everlasting punishment. We thank thee, Lord, that thy grace is sufficient for us, and therefore we are enabled daily to put off the old man and to put on the new man who is created in righteousness and holiness. Daily we are enabled to live more and more unto right and to die more and more unto sin. And we pray, Lord, that we would be earnest in this work, in this great activity, this great uh, responsibility that we have in this world, in that we are to work out our salvation, and we do so in fear and trembling, knowing that these are the issues of life and the issues of death. And if we do not work out our salvation in fear and trembling, then there is no evidence that we have new life within us. But we thank thee, Lord, that thy people are enabled to work out their salvation in fear and trembling, because it is God himself who works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We pray, therefore, Lord, that we will be earnest in this work. It is a daily work. It's a, it is a lifelong work. But we have the assurance in this world that we are more than conquerors, and we have the assurance that sin shall not have dominion over us. Bless us, therefore, we pray, and we pray, O Lord, as we gather at this time, that we would seek to offer unto thee acceptable worship. O oh Lord, uh, the worship of God is must be acceptable. And we thank thee, O Lord, that although our worship is imperfect, it is presented before thy throne through our advocate, through the mediator, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the o only mediator between God and man. And we thank thee, Lord, that the, our worship uh, does not go directly into heaven. If it did, it would be rejected because of its impurity. And we thank Thee, all our worship, all our praise goes through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for His sake and in His name that we petition Thee. And He, as it were, purifies our worship and presents that worship originally full of flaws and full of def 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 deficiencies, deformities, even sin itself. He presents it before Thyself. And He presents His own work as the true basis upon our acceptance. Uh, for which we are upon which we are accepted by thee, even his finished work and his perfect righteousness. We pray therefore, Lord, that we would seek to worship thee at this time. We thank thee for those who gather here in this place from time to time as a witness to this community, and we pray, Lord, that thou hast blessed this witness. It's a reminder to those round about us that this is the Lord's day, this is the day that thou hast made. And it's a day when we ought to gather, all men ought to gather, to worship thee, to give thanks unto thee, for thou art good unto all men. And we thank, we, 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 we grieve, O Lord, eh, at the ingrat ingratitude of man. What a, a sin that is. And then the great day of judgment, when all the goodness of God to every man who ever lived in this world will be made known, as we believe. And the fact that most of the those who were the recipients of God's goodness did not give thanks. What a, what a condemnation that will be. So that the condemnation of God is a just condemnation. Many other sins, O Lord, will be brought before us on that day. But this sin of ingratitude, of unthankfulness, will be brought before us. And that in itself will be sufficient to condemn us. But we thank thee, Lord, that um, thy people do thank thee for thy mercies. And we pray, Lord, that the witness in this place will, will speak to others, that they would realise, particularly at this time, when there is so much fear abroad, there is so much uncertainty, we cannot, even those who are so much at ease with their own lives, cannot but realise that there are so many uncertainties, even dangers, involved in, in the world at this time. And we pray, therefore, Lord, that we use these judgments these visitations to speak to us uh, that we would uh, learn wisdom when thy judgments are abroad upon the earth that is what thou dost counsel us to do 
that we should seek wisdom and the wisdom we should seek is thyself we should seek thee where thou art to be found and call upon thee while thou art near uh, for thou art reminding us O Lord of the, the brevity of time and the certainty of death and if death was the end then perhaps we might not need to be afraid we would be full of regrets but death is not the end after death there is a judgment for which must all be prepared and we pray, Lord, that therefore, uh, even this day as the gospel is preached, many would be making that preparation, that thou wouldst be preparing many sinners this day to meet the free through uh, faith and repentance. Believe faith in the Lord Jesus, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. Bless once again uh, this congregation. We pray for it. Particularly at this time, the Lord is there without an under shepherd. We pray, Lord, that in thy good providence and in thy way, thou would appoint an under-shepherd to take charge of this congregation, take charge of their souls, to go in and out amongst them, to be an example to the flock, and to break unto them the bread of life. That is thy purpose and thy pattern for thy church. And we pray, O Lord, that this would be fulfilled in this congregation also, and that all those connected with this congregation should be engaged in prayer to this end. Uh, there is much, O Lord, that has to be considered, has to be done. Uh, but we thank Thee, Lord, that if we commit our ways unto Thee, Thou wilt guide our steps. And we pray, Lord, that this would be through of each one of us at this time. Pray there is now bless us, O Lord, as we further wait before Thee. There is so much, O Lord, that we could bring before Thee, but we do not bring anything before thee that thou dost not already know. Thou dost know even our deepest thoughts, uh, our secret, our secret, the secrets of our heart. Thou dost know them all. Thou dost know our motives, as we mentioned, seek to mention in the morning. Thou dost know the motivations of our heart. And we pray, Lord, that thou therefore would give us a pure heart, that we'd have clean hands and pure hearts as we would ascend unto thy holy hill. For it is such who are qualified by thyself to be accepted in thy presence. Bless us now, we pray, and continue with us. Forgive and cleanse us from all sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we have the intimations for this evening. Welcome to all who have joined us for our worship service today. Service is next Lord's Day at Port Mahomac at 12 noon and 6.30 p.m. And the preacher expected is the Reverend John McPherson. <laughs> Sunday school next week at 11.15am in the church vestry. The midweek meeting is on Wednesday at 7.30pm via Zoom. And all these intimations are subject to God's will. So we now continue to worship God by singing to his praise in Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and we shall sing from the beginning of the psalm. Psalm 32 and singing from the beginning of the psalm. O oh, blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned all the transgressions he hath done whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not his sin and in whose spirit there is no guile nor fraud is found therein. And so on down to the end of double verse 5. Psalm 32 singing from the beginning. O oh, blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned. Yeah. Hey. 
Now we now read in the Word of God and in the New Testament and in the Epistle of Paul to the Romans and in chapter 3. The Epistle of Paul to the Romans and reading in chapter 3 and um, we can read the whole chapter. What advantage then hath the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that which that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous, who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through life unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Amen, and may God add a blessing to that reading of his own word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Shall we now continue to worship God by singing his praise in Psalm 78? Psalm 78, and we shall sing from verse 36. Psalm 78, singing from verse 36. Yet with their mouth they flattered him, and spake but feignedly. And they unto the God of truth with their false tongues did lie. For though their words were good, their heart with him was not sincere, and steadfast and perfidious they in his covenant were. And so on down to the end of verse 41, Psalm 78, singing from verse 36, Yet with their mouth they flattered him, and spake but feignedly. Yet with their mouth they flattered him, Oh, 
Shall we now turn again to the chapter we read in the Epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 3. And um, I would like to consider the last verses, number of verses from verse 20 uh, to the end of the chapter. And if we were to think of one particular text, well, we could look at verse 20 itself, itself. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And then there's another verse in chapter 8 which touches on this subject, uh, which tells us here, for what the law could not do, in fact the whole, the first three verses, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. But particularly, verse 3, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. And uh, depending how time is, there's perhaps... Uh, one or two other points that we would like to discuss. But I think to begin with, we will consider what we have here from verse 20. It's to do with the law. And what Paul is saying here, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, some would say this. Well, we can all agree with it. If the law doesn't save us, What's the purpose or what's the value in the law? And there are people today, and the term, a big name for them, perhaps is called antinomians. Anti, of course, is against, and nomos is the Greek word for law. So it means they're against law. Antinomians. And that's uh, what uh, some Christians, they may be true Christians, but certainly they're Christians in error, in serious error. And what they say is this, and they use scripture. You see, again, we've got to be careful what we call heresy. But no heresy, no error has arisen in the church in the history uh, uh, except that there has been some scriptures quoted for it. We touched on that in the morning, didn't we, in a sense? Peter says that. That there are those who twist the scripture. And all the heretics and all the heresies that have afflicted the church right from the beginning didn't come in later on. There was heresies throughout, but they began in Paul's time. There were some who didn't believe in the physical resurrection of Christ, in the body resurrection of Christ, in Paul's day, and many other things besides. And a text that is used for antinomianism is that we are not under law, but we're under grace. We're not under law, we're under... That is true, isn't it? We're not... A... We're not under law, but we're under grace. But what does it mean? Does that mean we dispense with the law? No, we'll come to, we'll come to try to show that. Well, this chapter shows it to us. We will consider the law. We will consider the purpose of the law. We will consider the limitations of the law, certainly. But the New Testament, the, the gospel, does not dispense with the law. What then does it mean when it says we're not under law but under grace? What does that mean? Well, it's all set out before us in this chapter and throughout the whole scripture and in many other parts of this letter of Paul. It means this. Under law for salvation. Under law to be accepted with God. We can't, we're not under law for that purpose. Why not? For this is why we're going to be repeating ourselves, no doubt. For by the works of the law, we're told, shall no flesh be justified. And there are those who say, well, what's the purpose of law then? And they dispense with the law. You can see the logic, can't you? You can see the reasoning. It has an appearance of soundness. If law, if we're not saved by if we're not saved by the law, we're saved by grace. Well, why do we need the law? What's the point of the law? Hey, we can dispense with the law. That's what they say. And that's why there were groups, I don't want to go to all the heresies, obviously, 
But that's why in the early church, second century, there's heresies arising all the time. There was a heresy called Marcionism. And what Marcion said was this, the Christian church doesn't need the Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. And you know the reason why. Because the Old Testament is full of law. That is true. Not just law. But the whole you think of the, the laws in the Old Testament. As I said before, I'm reading through them. You sometimes maybe when you're reading through them, you think they're tedious. But the more you think of these laws, meticulous they are. And of course, the purpose of law, we're going to see what the purpose was. And any person reading these laws and the obligations that they imposed, what's, what would be their conclusion? What, would, what, what, what conclusion would I come to? What conclusion should those who are reading the law then and those who still read it without the New Testament such as you? What, what's the conclusion they should come to? The conclusion is this. Who is sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient to fulfill these laws? And what then does, what's the purpose of the law? That's the purpose of the law. One of the purposes of the law is this, and the law, we're going to divide up the law in a minute, perhaps you should this now. The purpose, how does Paul then say, what's the purpose of the law? This is the purpose of the law. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. What does Paul mean by that? He means this, just as we've said. When you consider these laws, cover every area of your life, and if a person was honest and they examined their life in the light of these laws that were laid out, divine laws, they weren't invented by men, they were given by God to be obeyed. And any failure to obey them incurred guilt before God and Atonement had to be made, sacrifice had to be made for breaches of the law that was given by God in the Old Testament. And the purpose, one of the purposes of that law is this. It gives us, and we'll come to this in a, in a moment, it's, it's in our text, by the law. It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And what, what, what's, what does that mean? It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Because we realise and it should convince us if we take the laws as we ought and any person who believes the, the Bible and, and uh, as the word of God and any Jew at that time, sadly today there are Jews who have been affected also, sadly, by ha this unbelief of what they call higher criticism. Not all Jews believe the Bible to be the word of God today, sadly. They've been affected. Again, I don't want to get sidetracked. What a terrible legacy the Christian church, the, the professing Christian church has imparted to the Jews today. You see, the higher criticism, it wasn't a product of Romanism or any other ism. It was a product of pro so-called Protestantism, begun in Germany towards the end of the 18th century. And from then it spread through Germany. And then it spread to the United Kingdom. It affected the Protestant churches. Even today, <laughs> Roman Catholics are, are affected by it. The soul of the Jews, what a fear for, instead of for provoking them to jealousy. That's what Paul said that the Gentiles should do. We should be provoking the Jews to jealousy. What does that mean? By showing in our lives and in our, under, in our way of life. It should be, in a sense, to put it in a maybe crude way, in a sense, showing them up, living the way that they should live. That's what Paul says. We should be provoking the Jews to jealousy. He says that, I think it's in, 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 in this very epistle. But what a legacy. It's a twofold legacy. We've touched it before in fellowship. It's a twofold legacy. And think of this. Where did it begin? It began in the land of the Reformation. What was the land of the... We talk, think of Scotland, and we should think of Scotland. Scotland wasn't the, the land of the Reformation. The land of the Reformation was Germany. Martin Luther. That's where the Reformation began of the 16th century. What a legacy. Luther, we didn't agree with everything Luther said, but what a legacy that was. Gospel spreading from Germany to Switzerland, to France, 
to England, to Scotland, to North America and throughout the world. That's what we owe to Germany. We should never forget that. But we've also, Germany has bequeathed, if that's the right word, not bequeathed, we have to say cursed. Cursed the church with two fearful condemnations, if you like. What's is a better word than that? Indictments. One was the higher criticism when men put their own, and they were able men. The Germans are a very intelligent race. People will tell you that. The great thinkers. The one, some would say, that, I don't want to get into philosophy, but I'll just mention the passage. The, some would say the greatest philosopher, modern philosopher, was a German man called Kant, Immanuel Kant. Other great philosophers in other countries, and particularly Germany, he's regarded as the greatest modern philosopher by most modern philosophers. Great thinker! Now, we don't get into Kant. I haven't read all, I think I would like to read about Kant. And I'm not saying he was responsible for the higher criticism, but Germany was a highly cultured, intelligent people. The universities were regarded. Students from other countries used to go to Germany because they were these professors, renowned professors. They could study. I mean, they did that. And sadly, they also did that for the in Scotland. What happened was in theology, Students went from Scotland to study in German universities. People like A.B. Davidson, for instance. I think Robertson Smith as well. I don't know about Marcus Dawes. And they imbibed the higher criticism. It began in Germany. The land of the Reformation. You see, we said that in the morning, didn't we, in a sense? Because we started well, doesn't mean that we're going to end well. And that was repeated in many churches, we said. Free church. It was repeated in the free church. And that's one of... That's, that's, that's a, a legacy for which the Protestant church should be ashamed. Unbelief exported to other countries, but also exported to the Jews. Imagine that. They've imbibed it. If you go to Israel today, not Israel, America, they've got, they've got, they've got their seminaries. The Jews have got their colleges where they train rabbis and Able, able men, and so many of them. I wouldn't like to put a percentage, but they're affected. They're infected by the same unbelief. Imagine that. Those for whom we receive the scriptures, those to whom God had entrusted the oracles of God, they God entrusted, and they and they and they and they, and they preserve the scriptures for us. We have the scriptures because of the Jews. They preserved them for us. How much we owe to the Jews for the script of the Old Testament. And here is the Protestant church, so-called Protestant church, the apostate church, developing what they call, it's unbelief, it's as simple as that, but they dress it up in intellectual terms. It sounds intellectual, higher criticism. It's unbelief. And the Jews, how tra when I think of that, how tragic it is. They've imbibed it. Time is coming, of course, when they will repudiate it. When they will look upon Christ whom they have pierced, when the veil will be removed from their eyes, they will look upon Christ. They, they, will, no longer, they will no longer talk about the Bible as, as, as full of myths or fiction, as some of them do. But there's something else, and again, what we're talking about, there's another, in fact, the, the, a crime. It's hard to call that a legacy. That, that, that has bequeathed, that Germany has bequeathed to us. Think of this. I've said it before, we haven't necessarily linked, made the connection, but what was the greatest crime of the 20th century? And it, in fact, that one would suggest the greatest crime in history, leaving aside the crucifixion of Christ. The attempted and almost successful genocide of the Jews destroying the Jews, <laughs> wiping them off the face of the earth. And which country was it? Who was it that had that as their aim, as their intention, as their policy? We know who it was. The same country, the same country, Germany. What a fearful indictment that is of Protestantism. How can we 
exculpate himself. How can we escape the guilt of that? How do we, how, how do you, how do I? I, I think we've, we've got to say something about it. Can we defend ourselves? Well, I would say I was kind of I'm getting distracted, but I'll say this. I don't know if I've said this before, but there are two, two, two well-known writers who believe the Bible. They, they believe the Scripture. One that you're familiar with and quite sure, a man called John Murray, born <coughs> not far from here, up in Sutherlandshire, Bad Bay, Sutherlandshire. He was free church, then his parents went to the Free Presbyterian Church, and he went to America to study, and he left the Free Presbyterian Church, and he became a professor in America. And he's written many, many books, which you and I benefit from today. John Murray. And he wrote he wrote an essay, he wrote an essay around the beginning of the during the war in nineteen forty one. And he talks about Germany. How can such a cultured people as Germany be so now this is before it was known about this was in forty one, this is before the Holocaust was really known. It was more just the the warmongering. The belligerence of Germany, which applied to the First World War as well as the Second World War, particularly the Second, but First as well. How can we explain it, said Murray? And his explanation, I agree with it wholeheartedly. When Germany discarded the Bible, that's how they reverted to barbarism. And another man, just while we're here, is another man, Hammond, perhaps he's not quite so well known, T.C. Hammond, he was an Irishman. And he was an Anglican, Church of England. And he went from Ireland to Sydney, Australia. And he wrote in many books, and he was the principal of the college in Sydney, the Moore Theological College in Sydney. And uh, he was a sound man. Again, we didn't agree with everything he said, but a sound man. He believed the Bible. And his understanding of Rome, of course, he wrote in books on Rome as well. And he wrote a book a copy of it, a smallish book and he dealt with, the, I can't remember its name something Fading Light I think it's called, Fading Light on the same subject about the Second World War he wrote it just in the you know, early 40s, during the war he asked the same question now I don't, he makes no reference to John Murray in this, in this book, I don't know which wrote for around about the same time and he comes to the same conclusion as Murray did the reason why Germany, and again he didn't touch on the Holocaust because it wasn't so well known when he wrote it. He was quite clear, these two men, these are, these are sound orthodox conservative theologians, men who believe the Bible. And they came to the same conclusion when uh, he, um, it's the very same thing as we said, it was when Germany adopted what they call higher criticism, which was the discarding of the Bible. What a lesson there is for you and I individually and as churches, as, as a, and that's really perhaps more applicable to this morning. Now, I'm not quite sure how we get on to this, but we, we, we're going to get back to our text. Purpose of thought, yes, antinomianism. We talked about heresies and so on. Antinomianism. Antinomianism. That, that is in the church today. It's widespread. We're under... Grace, we're not under law, therefore the Ten Commandments are not binding on us. Think of that. Because the Ten Commandments are law. Oh, they're not saying that we just do the opposite, but they're not binding on us. In a sense, that's almost saying the same. You know? Antinomianism. Well, what does Paul say about the law? Well, he says two things. This is what he says here. He says in this, verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of law shall no flesh be justified. The, jaw, the, the law cannot save us. It cannot make us right with God. But the law is important. The law fulfills a function. More than one function. And the function that's mentioned here is quite clear. Necessary function. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be judged. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Is that important? 
Is that important? To know what sin is, is that important? Of course it's important. If you and I don't know what, what sin is, we'll never repent of our sin. We'll never be saved from our sin. That's why the law, that's why the law is fundamental. It won't save us. But because it won't save us, doesn't mean it's not necessary. We will use the distinction. It's, it's not sufficient to save us, but it's still necessary to save us. You see, there's a difference there. Without a knowledge of sin, none of us would be saved. But not only that, and this is the, the this is ties in with it. The verse we quoted already. The law I don't know if it was it was in verse eight, no? I don't think it was sorry, chapter eight. It doesn't really matter, but we have it by memory, I think. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. What does that mean? It tells us this. Two things at least it says here. Firstly, it gives us the knowledge of sin. Tells us what sin is. Now we could go into the distinctions of the law, but we don't have time. We're talking now about the, the written law. We're talk, but we can talk about our conscience. We're told that God's law has written in our hearts. God has, God has written his law in our hearts. You see, we can't escape. You see the provision that God has made. Some might say, this is to leave us without excuse. It is to leave us without excuse, but it's a schoolmaster. Not, to, not just to condemn us, it's to bring us to Christ. You see the grace, the, there's grace in the law. It doesn't save us, but it leads us to Christ who saves us. You see the graciousness of God, when you read and when I read, well let's confine it to the Ten Commandments. We can talk about many other laws in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law, the sacrificial law. Let's just confine it to what we call the moral law, the Ten Commandments, which we're familiar with. You see the, see the gracious purpose in giving us the law. It's not just to condemn us for our sin. Yes, it leaves us without excuse before God. That is, that's got a gracious purpose. It cannot save us, that is true. But it is there to lead us to Christ who saves. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Now our time is well on. I'm looking at the clock and I, I can see it. But the question we can ask, there's so much more that we, we can't, we should say. But the question we can ask, we can ask ourselves a question at this, at this stage. What about, the, what about you and the law? Has the law fulfilled this gracious purpose in your experience? That's the purpose of it. Has the law been a schoolmaster to you? And how do you know whether it is a... Well, the question is this. Have you been brought to Christ? If you've been brought to Christ, the law has played a major part. That pastor Paul said it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And how so? I have to be very brief. That's what the law can do. It's a school that brings us to Christ. It tells us about sin. It cannot save us. Put it this way. There, there is, again, <laughs> there's a lot that could be said, but we, 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 we're not going to say it. Uh, the law has got no power, not just to save us, it's got no power to enable us to obey the law. See what I'm saying? That's a commandment. And it's a commandment from God. But the law, the commandment, is a, does not contain power to enable us to obey, to fulfill the law. Oh, it's from God. And what does Paul say regarding the law? It is holy and good. I am convinced in my mind to say that the law is just and good. And he goes on to say, with my mind, he says, and this is Paul speaking even as a Christian. With my mind, he says, I approve the law of God. If you're a believer, you don't question, and you certainly shouldn't, we must never question the law of God. We approve it. It is good, it is holy, and just, and good. Think of the, is there any of the Ten Commandments that you don't agree with? Is there any of the commandments that you would say it's not holy, or just, or good? Well, that's a that that, that if, if 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 someone was to say that, 
what questions that places upon them, upon the, 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 their, 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 their faith, their salvation. Paul says, I approve with my mind, he says. With my mind I approve the law. That it is whole. But he says, this is the way, but how to perform? I know not. That's your, if you're a Christian, that's your experience. How to perform, I know not. The law says, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery. And that includes lusting. Jesus applies the, the, the depths and the application of the Ten Commandments, not just in outward deed. None of us has fulfilled, none of us can perform these perfectly. That's what Paul says. And he, as we said in the morning, what an example of faith Paul was. What an example of obedience Fossil Paul was. Not a perfect man, but some would say, some would say that, I think I remember Mr. Joseph, who knows the Bible well, and not only Mr. Joseph, says that, that that's Paul, Paul's probably the most perfect example we have in Scripture of a Christian, not just in his belief, but in his... Uh, I, I, I could say more about that, but, but that's what that's Paul's confession, and he was he he was sincere, and you should be. Do you want to fulfil the law of God? You approve it. If you approve it, it's holy. Then you want to fulfil it, don't you? That's what Paul says. I approve it, but how to perform? I know not. Is that your experience? It is your experience. You cannot fulfil the law. You want to fulfil it. You can't fulfill it. Now, it doesn't mean that you disobey in every aspect. It doesn't mean that you go out and rob a bank. It doesn't mean you, you know, commit adultery or whatever, or kill someone. But there's more to the law than that. As Jesus said, we want is the spirit, what's called the spirituality of the law. And you and I, we cannot fulfil it. How to perform, I know not. And um, so, so that so the law has got a good purpose. We can't. Therefore, what all I'm, what we're seeing is this. I think what we've tried to, what we said just now, is that not sufficient? If it's scriptural, as we said, to show that antinomianism is false, we cannot dispense with the law. It is holy, just, and good. It's our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and it's by the law that we have the knowledge. But it. But the, the deficiencies of this, it's got no power to enable us to fulfil it, and it cannot save us. And now we cannot finish there, although our time is gone, and what we will just quickly do is, is uh, in fact, th th this, is where, this, this is where chapter 8, really, uh, which we, we, we read briefly, that, that's how it's so real. We'll just read this quickly. and make, It's on the surface, I would say, what we need to say here. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And this is the, this summed up in verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. It couldn't save us. It couldn't justify us. It couldn't make us acceptable to God. It was weak. Why? It was wholly just and good. Is that why it was weak? No. It's not because of anything the law that it was weak. It's because of what was in us and because of the flesh, because of our sin. We couldn't fulfill it. That was the purpose of the law, to be obeyed. And we couldn't do it. The fault was not in the law. The fault was in you and I, in our sin, in our fallen nature, in our flesh. For what the law, for, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, this is with the God. This is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. God Sending his own son in the light of sinful flesh and for sin. Condemned sin in the flesh. And that is what we have in our text here, really. In this the verses here, it says here, uh, it's uh, really being, be, be, verse 24, 25, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Very quickly, verse 25. This is the gospel. Whom God has sent, this is Christ, who God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. The law cannot save us, but it brings us to Christ who can save us. And how does Christ save us? Because he is a propitiation. 
for our sins. What does the propiti what does propitiation mean? Well, you, you've, we've all heard this, I'm sure, from many sermons. You remember in the Old Testament there was a place of atonement. It was in the tabernacle, and, it, and then became it was in the temple. It was called the 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 the, the, the ark. <laughs> That's the ark. The, the part of that. It was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. And the word that's used in scripture is a Greek word. I'm not sure of the Hebrew word. Well, I, I don't know. Hilasterian, I think, is a Greek. That's what it is. It, that, that's, the, that's the name of the mercy seat. The place where atonement was made. The place where a propitious. That's what propitious means. It means an atonement. It means that which satisfies God and satisfies the justice of God. That's how we're saved. God's justice must be satisfied. The law tells us what that justice is and we cannot fulfill it. But God sending his son Christ in the form of sinful flesh, of course, condemns sin in the flesh. He made an atonement for sin. He is our mercy seat, you might. He is our, I think, Helastrian is the Greek. He is our mercy seat. That's where atonement was. There. Remember, remember in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, when he is in the temple and he sees God high and lifted up. Indeed, in fact, uh, the Lord high and lift. I sh should have said this before when we talked in Isaiah 6. Yeah, I think the commentators would make it clear that uh, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, in the New Testament, Christ applies that to himself. It was Christ he saw in the temple, the Lord high and lifted up. Christ refers to that in the New Testament. I haven't checked the reference, but it's, it, it, I've heard those who, who have, 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 uh, have, have uh, identified that. And what are we told there? There was Isaiah, he was convicted of his sin. And what was the remedy for his sin? And he was a believer, and that's the remedy for your sin and mine, as believers. It's a remedy for the sin of all men. There was an altar. There was an altar there. And there was a live coal on the altar, a place of sacrifice. Now the mercy seat and the mercy seat uh, very closely connected. The, the, the sacrifice weren't burnt in the mercy seat, but the blood of a sacrifice was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. The atonement was made, and that's how you and I are saved. We're saved by blood. People don't like to hear that. That's what the Bible says. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's your salvation. Your salvation is in the shedding of blood. It's not the shedding of the blood of bulls and of goats. That can never take away sin. But as we say to you, God sent his Son in the form of sinful flesh and for sin to make a propitiation for our sin. So there we have now, there's more, much more that could be said, perhaps should have been said. But there's so many, there's lessons here and we don't want to repeat things, but let us make sure that we never demote, if, or even we certainly not reject or demote the law of God. Let us not become antinomians. The law of God cannot save us, but it's to be a rule of life. The Ten Commandments cannot save us, but there are schoolmasters to bring us to Christ, but they're also, we could have said a lot more, but they're also a rule of life. How do you, how are you to, 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 to order your life? How am I to order my life in a way that pleases God? It's according to the Ten Commandments. Now, the first thing, the first thing to do is not the Ten Commandments. I'll say that. Without faith we cannot please God. Whether we try to adhere. Again we've said all this before. So we said so much. Remember the Pharisee in the temple. He thought he was observing the Ten Commandments. That was his life. Keep the commandments of God. Not done this, not that. But he, he, he forgot the first requirement. The first requirement was faith and repentance. That's the first thing that you need and I need. We need faith and repentance. Without faith we cannot please God. That's the first requirement. Remember the publican, that was his prayer. Be merciful, repent of worship. But after, to please God, 
for, then there is faith and repentance. But how do we order our life after that? What is, how do we live? Do we live as they please? We cannot live as we please. After faith and repentance, our lives are to be ordered according to the law of God. This is simply, is some is summarily comprehending the Ten Commandments. That's that that's the scriptural. So let's be aware of that. But above all, let us let, let, let us let us let us accept. There is much that can be said about the law, but let us know, as we've said already, what it cannot do. It cannot save us. But it directs us to one who can save us. And he fulfilled the law, he made it honourable. But he did more than that, he made an atonement for the sins of those who trust him, for those who couldn't keep the law. First of all, he kept the law perfectly, but not only that, he made an atonement for the breaches of the law which you and I commit daily if we trust Christ. Well, there we have something here, much more that, 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 that than we've said, but that's... So, so we, we you know, summarise it, you know, there's no summary verse there, but the law and salvation, you, you cannot dispense with it. You cannot dispense with the law. If you dispense with the law, there is no schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Remember, Mr. Mr. Fru used to put it this way, I think, I think it's applicable. He would talk about the gospel vice. Vice meaning... Uh, an implement, a technical name for it, no doubt. And he would say, on the one hand, you've got the command. One of the jaws of the vice is a command. Obey! Obey and you shall live! Keep the commandments. You know. Now, and the sinner, that, that's, one, that, that's one jaw, if that's the right term, of the vice. And the other vice in the cup there is, I cannot do it. I cannot fulfil it. And the sinner is caught between these two jaws of the vice. So what does he do? He cries out to God, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He looks to God for deliverance. That's faith. And he, where does he look? But he looks to Christ. That's what the law does. The law reveals to us and shows us that we cannot keep it for salvation. Well, salvation couldn't be good to that. But it points us to one who has fulfilled the law, who can save us. And the question we you is this, I will just repeat it again, is that, is, is, can you say that, that you have seen the impotence of, not the impotence of the law itself, it doesn't give you power, and your impotence because of the flesh to fulfill the law, but also that it, uh, you have you have been brought to Christ. Christ is the end of the law. Not the end of the law for obedience, but the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. Now there's so much in that that I'm conscious that we've not really said all that we should have said. But that's something that we can ponder and ask ourselves. And at the end of the, the, any, any yeah. exposition of Scripture, there must be the question of, Looking to Christ, that's what that's what we've, this this leads us to look to Christ for salvation. And we look to Christ by faith. It is by faith that we receive and rest upon Christ alone for salvation, as He is freely offered to us in the gospel. Now may God bless these thoughts upon His word. Now, time is gone, so we can conclude by singing in verse in, in chapter. I beg your pardon. In Psalm sixteen. Psalm 16. Now, um, I'm conscious that we didn't read out the intimation. I'll just read them out, although we heard them. The I'll read them out after, after we sing. Um, Psalm 16, and singing from the beginning, Lord, keep me, for I trust in thee. To God thus was my speech. Thou art my Lord, and unto thee my goodness doth not reach. <coughs> <coughs> to saints on earth, to the excellent, where my delights all placed, their sorrows shall be multiplied mm -hmm. to other gods that hate. We can just sing the first three verses, our time is past. Lord, keep me, for I trust in thee. To God, this was my speech.
Now the intimation, as we've heard already, is a welcome to all who have joined with us for worship today. Serves his next Lord at Port Mahomic at 12 noon and 6.30pm. Preacher expected, the Reverend John McPherson. Sunday school next week, 11.15am in the church vestry. And the midweek meeting at 7.30 via Zoom. And all these are subject to God's will. We pray, Lord, that thou wouldst go before us. Keep us, we pray, and cleanse us from all sin. Help us, O Lord, to seek to honour Thee as uh, Thy law has been given to us as a rule of life. We all come short, but we thank Thee that our deficiencies are made up, more than made up, through the work of Christ who performed, oh, He, 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 he made perfect that which uh, we lacked. His obedience was perfect to the law of God. He honoured the law. He obeyed the law and made it honourable. Help us all, therefore, to strive after holiness, without which no man shall see thee. Bless us now and continue with us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.